You might think I'm a complete fool, the most oblivious and foolish of husbands. However, hindsight is always 20-20ths. Like most happily married men, I trusted and loved my wife. I had no idea that the woman I adored for eight years, with whom I shared countless intimate moments and happy memories, was a selfish monster. To be precise, she was one of three selfish monsters. Molly's two sisters have been a part of my life almost from our first date. I had never encountered identical triplets before, so meeting them was both unsettling and thrilling. When I first met Molly at the grocery store, she asked me to reach a top shelf for some herbal tea she couldn't reach. Molly is about fives, curvy, and stunningly beautiful with short jet black hair. Being slightly taller than six feet myself, I was the obvious choice to help her out. It wasn't until our fourth date that Molly revealed she had noticed me in the produce section, found me cute, and had been waiting by the herbal tea for me to assist her. It was quite flattering, to say the least. What made it even more special was that she shared this story while lying undressed in my arms after we had just made love for the first time. Our initial dates were absolutely magical. We dined out, talked until late, strolled in the park feeding ducks, and even watched a cheesy chick flick holding hands the entire time. Sounds cliche, doesn't it? Yet, I was utterly captivated and enchanted. Molly was the most stunning woman I had ever met, alluring in a genuine way, the quintessential girl next door with a smile that could win over anyone. After helping her with the tea, she amiably chatted with me, letting me believe I was impressing her, which thrilled me to no end. As I was heading to the checkout with plans for another date the following Friday, she vaguely mentioned having sisters. However, I was unprepared to be greeted by three beautiful women when one opened the door and said, Hello. You must be Scott. I was speechless. You're not Molly, I stammered. She laughed as charmingly as Molly had at the grocery store and said, No, I'm Hannah. Molly, Amy, and I are triplets. Didn't she mention us? She chuckled again. Molly likes to have a little fun at your expense sometimes. I'll go get her. Come on in. There was another Molly in the living room, but it turned out to be Amy. With identical haircuts, figures, and dazzling smiles, I couldn't distinguish between them until Molly appeared from one of the bedrooms and greeted me. Hello, Scott. Would you like a nice cup of herbal tea? During our first dinner, our conversation covered a wide range of topics, but we delved deeply into Molly's life as a triplet. I was captivated and eager to learn about their unique experiences. Did she constantly feel like she was looking at two other versions of herself? Were their bonds stronger than most siblings? They seemed to have an almost telepathic connection, as identical twins often do. Can we read each other's minds? Molly pondered aloud. I'm not sure but we're incredibly close. I usually have a good sense of what Amy or Hannah is thinking, and they often anticipate my thoughts too, like answering a question I haven't voiced yet. It's always been this way. Pausing for a moment, she smiled at me and continued, as for tricking people. We've had our fun with that. Have you noticed we all sport the same hairstyles? I nodded, and she elaborated. As kids, we loved playing tricks on people, our elementary school teachers, relatives, even our parents couldn't tell us apart. It was especially amusing when Amy or Hannah got into trouble and tried to dodge punishment. No, Dad, I'm Molly. Not Amy, she mimicked with a grin. You can imagine the chaos that ensued. In high school, we yearned to be distinct individuals. We wore different hairstyles, attended separate classes, and pursued different activities. For instance, I was on the yearbook staff. Amy wrote for the school newspaper, and Hannah played field hockey. However, we eventually missed our identical appearances, so we reverted to looking alike. Occasionally, I'd take a chemistry test for Amy, or Hannah would give a presentation on my behalf. It evened out our grades a bit, she chuckled. Then there was that time during our junior year when Brad Hendrick asked Amy out on a date. She was smitten but fell ill on the day of their date, distraught, fearing he'd never ask her out again if she canceled. She persuaded me to stand in for her. It wasn't too difficult since it was their first date and they hadn't gotten to know each other well. 
Amy took over from the second date onward, and they dated for nearly a year without him ever knowing about the switch. I later look back on this with a tinge of bitterness, but sitting across from Molly at that moment. A beautiful, cheerful, enchanting girl, I was already head over heels for... Her. The fact that she seemed to reciprocate my feelings was simply unbelievable. It was almost like a fairy tale. The three girls ventured off to college and relished their independence. Yet they yearned for each other's company. After graduation, they all relocated to Cincinnati, sharing a spacious apartment. That's where I met Molly and her sisters for the first time when I picked her up for a date. Fast forward eight years. Molly and I had fallen in love and tied the knot. I felt like the luckiest person alive. I landed a job at a graphic design company where my computer skills made me a valuable asset, ensuring a good income. We comfortably purchased a charming three-bedroom house in Oakley Square, just a short distance from our downtown workplace. And you probably won't be shocked to learn who our neighbors were. Three years post-marriage, Amy wedded Ted. A tall and somewhat dull finance guy. Friendly, yes, but not exactly captivating. They settled next door to us on a quiet cul-de-sac named Ferdinand Place. Their backyard overlooked the residence on Oak Park Place where, as you might guess, Hannah and her husband Eri resided. Eri was the antithesis of Ted. Older than us, a jovial man who owns several bowling alleys in Cincinnati. He used to smoke cigars until Hannah persuaded him to quit. And he had a knack for cracking humorous, occasionally risk jokes. They had tied the knot a few months prior to Amy and Ted. It came as no shock to us husbands that our wives preferred living in close proximity. They were practically inseparable. Like triplets linked at the hip, Ted Airy and I grew accustomed to their synchronicity. Finishing each other's sentences or voicing identical thoughts. We also got used to their nightly rendezvous, gathering in one of our three kitchens around 9.30 or 10 p.m. for a chat before heading home. Even after eight years with Molly, I sometimes struggled to identify which sister was which. As Ted and Ari echoed, we became adept at recognizing their attire or identifying who wore specific jewelry. During a Christmas celebration with Pam and Donald, Molly's parents it became evident they too struggled to differentiate between their daughters, much like we did. However, this didn't imply they had identical personalities. Amy was slightly more stern and conservative than her siblings. Hannah, in contrast, was a free spirit. She indulged a bit more shared bolder jokes and might have been pegged as the most likely to pursue a career in unclothed bar dancing among the trio, though I doubt she ever did. My Molly struck a balance between them, and to me, she was flawless. Sweeter and more sociable than Amy, yet grounded compared to Hannah. It's not that you overlook the distinctions between the sisters during our gatherings, rather, distinguishing between them by appearance or voice was challenging. Essentially, if they aimed to deceive you, discerning the truth was impossible. Given that neither of us had kids at that time, planning vacations was straightforward. As you might expect, Molly and her siblings insisted we all vacation together. So each summer, we'd allocate two weeks to travel to captivating destinations like Las Vegas, North Carolina's beach resorts, or even Italy for a year. Our group meshed well, so the husbands were content. However, in return, I advocated for an annual one-on-one -on -one getaway with Molly, excluding Amy, Hannah, and our brothers-in-law. Initially, this proposal stirred disagreements and created tense moments with numerous debates and chilly atmospheres. It took Molly three years to grasp my sincerity fully. I cherish your sisters and enjoy the company of Ari and Ted, but I yearn for quality time just between us. Isn't that reasonable? My proposition was clear. You have a two-week trip with everyone annually, and I request one week exclusively with you. I must have reiterated this point countless times. However, it wasn't until the eve of our Italy trip, when Molly noticed my lack of packing progress, that she relented. That became the tipping point. I firmly stated that unless she agreed to our private week, I'd stay behind. She and the other couples could proceed to Italy without me. After enduring over an hour of heated arguments, during which I remained silent, 
Molly sought assistance from her sisters, Amy and Hannah. They repeatedly tried to persuade me, emphasizing my perceived selfishness and narrow-mindedness, insisting no caring husband would stand firm as I did. Eventually, Molly acquiesced to my request, and we proceeded with our Italy trip. However, there was a noticeable chill in our relationship for a few days, with her sisters reinforcing the notion that I was in the wrong. Were it not for the support of Ari and Ted, secretly pleased by my triumph as it paved the way for their own negotiations with their spouses, I might have contemplated an early return home. By the fifth day, the enchanting allure of Florence began to mend our strained relations. Molly and I enjoyed the rest of the journey, which was truly wonderful, reminiscent of our upcoming week on Sanibel Island that winter. Consequently, each year, we relished two fantastic weeks with Molly's siblings and another splendid week without them. Sounds perfect, doesn't it? And it largely was. However, complications arose when we decided to start a family. While Molly and I envisioned parenthood in our future, our present life, either as a couple or closely tied to two other couples, was too enjoyable to hasten the process. Yet, as Molly and her sisters approached 32, the biological urge became more pronounced. Molly ceased birth control, and shortly after, we embarked on our journey to conceive. I had no qualms about our goal, or the methods we employed. My love for Molly, my incredible wife, always made our intimate moments special. Typically, our encounters leaned towards the gentle and affectionate rather than the passionate and wild. While our repertoire consisted of a few favored positions, the spontaneous and playful nights became less frequent over time. Like many married couples, Molly occasionally surprised me with heightened desire, resulting in multiple intimate sessions. We'd indulge in champagne on special occasions, enhancing her enthusiasm. Nonetheless, our usual encounters were characterized by tenderness and love, which suited me perfectly. One evening, after an intense moment together, I playfully teased her about it, only to find out she wasn't pleased. On a Saturday, returning home from the store with groceries, I heard her call from our bedroom. I discovered her lying undressed, face down on the bed, holding massage oil. I've had a stressful day, cowboy, she murmured. Could you help me out? Intrigued, I massaged her back and legs while she sighed with contentment. Turning her over, I continued with my hands and later with my mouth, bringing her to climax three times. We then engaged passionately until we both reached a peak of pleasure. We spent a while cuddling, and Molly brought snacks from the kitchen. Dinner plans faded as we found ourselves caught up in each other once more. Catching our breath, I quipped. That was unforgettable, Molly. Pausing dramatically, I added, Or maybe you're not Molly. Did I just luck out with Amy or Hannah tonight? I sensed Molly's excitement like never before. However, instead of laughing or teasing back, she shot me a chilling glare. Scott, that's not amusing. How could you even suggest I'd do that? Do you truly believe I'd share you with my sisters? The room suddenly felt colder as she stared me down. Molly, I'm sorry. I quickly responded. I was just kidding, sweetheart. I tried to embrace her, but she moved away, announcing, I need a shower, and retreated to the bathroom. I heard the lock click, signaling her displeasure. For most of the next day, I felt like a ghost in our home. Molly seemed keen to emphasize that certain subjects weren't up for jokes. Finally, during Sunday dinner, I apologized once more, insisting it was a harmless jest. She seemed to ease up a bit that night, allowing me to cuddle up beside her in bed and I breathed a sigh of relief. I wasn't a fan of Molly being upset with me, so I mentally registered to avoid joking about trading sisters in the future. It was puzzling how strongly she reacted, especially since she'd shared a tale on our first date about stepping in for Amy on a date. I recalled a light-hearted disagreement a few weeks before our wedding about which hotel to choose for our Curacao honeymoon. Even though I eventually agreed with Molly's choice, our playful banter led me to jest about marrying one of her sisters. She retorted with humor, I doubt they'd want you, sweetheart. Amy and Hannah are light sleepers, and I warn them you snore. 
It might be a deal breaker. I shot back. Guess I'll stick with you then. We laughed it off, thinking nothing more of it. Thus, I was genuinely puzzled when she took offense to the same jest years later. As I previously mentioned, our efforts to start a family profoundly impacted me. After trying for approximately 10 months, I remained optimistic, knowing some couples took longer to conceive. Molly, however, grew increasingly anxious about our unsuccessful attempts, urging me to consult our doctor. Reluctantly, I did so. The experience of waiting in a clinic room filled with magazines and subsequently receiving Dr. Randall's call was quite memorable. During my workday that Friday, I discreetly took the call. Dr. Randall reassured me, Scott, there's no need for concern. Your sperm count is a bit below average, around 70% for a 30-year-old man. Nonetheless, your sperm are healthy and vigorous, just fewer in number. You and Molly shouldn't face issues conceiving, though it might take a bit longer than for some couples. Receiving the positive news about my sperm count was reassuring, and I looked forward to sharing it with Molly when I got home. However, it slipped my mind during our extended dinner conversation about Cincinnati city politics. It wasn't until nearly 11 p.m. that I remembered. Molly and her sisters often gathered in our kitchen after watching some basketball on TV. I headed to bed, often falling asleep before Molly joined me. As I was drifting off to sleep, the thought of sharing the news with Molly returned, and I felt an urgency to tell her right away. I quickly put on my robe and headed downstairs, planning to interrupt their kitchen chat to share the comforting news. Approaching the kitchen, I heard laughter from Molly and her sisters through the closed door. Their joyous interaction made me smile, and instead of entering right away, I paused to listen in. My intent was purely innocent. I was simply curious about their cheerful conversation. What I heard next caught me off guard. Voice one remarked, If Aries not the best, why do you always want to swap with me? Voice two giggled. I never said Ari wasn't great. I just mentioned Scott has certain skills. Voice three added, Or is it the second one? It's hard to keep track. You see Ari more often than any of us. Another voice quipped, Then you shouldn't complain. Laughter continued. I was stunned. It was hard to believe they were discussing the idea of swapping husbands for closeness. I quietly sat down to gather my thoughts and continued listening. It's been almost a year and I'm uncertain about Scott, one said. Must be Molly's issue, another speculated. Got a backup plan? Yes. If his recent test doesn't show improvement, we'll know soon. How will it work? Simple. I'll spend nights with Ted during my peak fertility. Spending every night with Scott gets monotonous. Afterward, I'll spend nights with Ari, but Molly is off limits. We won't revisit Ari until you're expecting. Laughter resumed. My initial shock hadn't yet evolved into anger. I struggled to accept the unsettling conclusion I had reached. Based on what I'd overheard, it seemed Molly was planning for Ted to father her child. While Ted and I shared many physical similarities, like hair and eye color, our body types differed slightly, with Ted being a bit taller and airy shorter and heavier, overwhelmed and fearful. I sat silently in the dimly lit living room, feeling as though my once happy marriage was unraveling before my eyes. Recognizing the tension brewing in the kitchen, I quietly retreated to our bedroom, slipping back into bed. I lay still, aware that confronting Molly impulsively wasn't the answer. Plus, with the uncertainty of which sister might join me later, I focused on calming my breath. Shortly after sensing someone slide into bed beside me, I felt a soft kiss on my cheek and heard a familiar I love you, baby, reminiscent of Molly's nighttime affection. Despite the surge of emotions tempting me to confront her, I remained still, regulating my breathing, waiting for her breathing to slow into the rhythm of sleep. I remained patient. After what felt like an eternity, I waited an additional hour to ensure she was genuinely asleep before cautiously leaving the bed. Considering their potential strategy, I realized swapping partners discreetly, especially just for closeness, wouldn't be too challenging. With their joint part-time roles as co-managers at an interior design store, they were all home in the mornings, making wardrobe changes straightforward. 
Weekends presented potential complications. I speculated they might stick to their usual partners or schedule swaps on alternate days. Given our frequent weekend gatherings, whether for barbecues, brunches, or other events, disguising any shifts would be relatively easy with simple excuses such as collecting a catalog from a sister. No, understanding the how wasn't a challenge. It was the why that left me perplexed. One might assume that husbands could easily distinguish their own wives from other women, right? But the reality was different. We had no grounds for suspicion before this. I was absolutely confident about the woman sharing my bed. Early in our marriage, Molly and I cherished those moments lying in bed. Engaging in deep conversations, either before, after, or sometimes in lieu of closeness. We delved into discussions about our relationship, future aspirations work, family, and everything in between. However, things took a turn. I can't pinpoint exactly when, but a few years back, Molly started to discourage our late night chats. She would return from spending time with her sisters, and we'd simply go to sleep. Whether or not we were intimate, my attempts to converse were often met with. I'm really tired. Let's discuss this tomorrow. For years, our significant talks be it about our days or future plans, occurred during dinner or earlier, never late at night in bed. This shift was likely intentional. Considering the possibility of women swapping partners, limited conversations minimize the chance of the wife being caught unaware or forgetting past details. Once I was certain Molly was asleep, I sneaked into the office, located the ink pad we used for stamping checks, and applied some permanent black ink to my finger. Back in the bedroom, I discreetly marked a small spot on her back, on the right side, midway between her shoulder and shoulder blade. The mark was tiny, akin to a pencil eraser, and she wouldn't have noticed unless she inspected her back in the mirror. Afterward, I washed off the excess ink from my finger with warm water and soap. As anticipated, the ink stayed put. Scrubbing only faded it slightly. I continued to use a pumice stone on my finger until the mark was so faint that it was nearly invisible. Returning to bed, a grim smile crossed my face as I pondered my next moves. The initial shock had subsided, replaced by profound anger. If my interpretation of the women's conversation was correct, Molly had betrayed me in a calculated and consistent manner, possibly over several years. She and her sisters seemed to prioritize their shared bond over the love and loyalty owed to their husbands. I felt manipulated, deceived, and utterly humiliated. I racked my brain trying to conceive a solution but saw no clear path forward. On Saturday afternoon, we gathered for a barbecue at Ted's place. I seized the opportunity when the women were inside, likely preparing food. Ted managed the grill while I invited Ari for a stroll around the block. Given his occasional weight concerns, he welcomed the chance for some physical activity. Once we were sufficiently away from the house, I broached the topic. Ari, can we discuss something personal for a moment? I hope that's all right. Of course, Scott. What's on your mind? Firstly, let's keep this conversation strictly between us, all right? I'd prefer Molly, Hannah, Amy, or even Ted not to know about it. If anyone asks... Let's just say we were discussing a potential trip to Greece next summer. Ari chuckled at the cover story, replying, Your secret's safe with me. Feeling a bit awkward, I ventured. I hate to ask, but how's your intimate life with Hannah? Molly and I are intimate once or twice a week, and I often wish it were more frequent. Do you experience the same with her sisters? Ari playfully slapped my back, laughing. Sounds like you drew the short straw, buddy. Hannah and I are at it nearly every night. Occasionally, we might skip due to her cycle or fatigue, but it's pretty consistent. Seeing my surprised look, he added with a smirk, Guess you chose the wrong sister, huh? But how could you know? It's just luck, I guess. Masking my inner turmoil with a disappointed face, I probed further. Has it always been like this since the start of your marriage? He paused to reflect. Mostly, yes. Hannah and I have this little routine or game. You know how women often gather in the kitchen during evenings? I nodded, urging him to continue. By the time she returns, I'm usually in bed, 
either reading or watching TV. She enters the bedroom with this specific look and always asks in a sultry voice, how do you want me tonight? We decide and that's it. It's usually that same phrase. It might sound silly, but as long as we're intimate, I'm content, he chuckled. I forced a smile. Shifting gears. Molly and I used to share deep conversations in bed about various topics. But lately, our bedroom is mainly for intimacy and sleep. Do you and Hannah converse in bed? We tend to reserve those meaningful discussions for other times of the day. It doesn't bother me much. But it does seem similar to your situation with Molly, he admitted with a chuckle. Bedroom's primarily for intimacy. Then it's lights out. On our way back to the house, Ari predominantly discussed his passion for the Cincinnati Bengals. During our conversation, Hannah and I attempted to engage at appropriate moments with affirmations like yes, I know, and really, but my mind was elsewhere, lost in a cold, dark, desolate place filled with anger. I managed to navigate through the entire afternoon and evening without breaking down, though some noticed my distant demeanor. I was resolute in enduring another day. After bidding Ted and Amy farewell, I treated Molly to her favorite Indian food for dinner, striving to be a cheerful companion throughout the evening. Around 10 p.m., Molly spent her usual time with Amy and her sisters. Upon her return, as we prepared for bed, I approached her from behind, gently massaging her neck and shoulders, searching for the ink mark. It was absent. It's over, I thought bitterly. Whoever you are, you and your sisters are going to face the consequences. Honey, I inquired. How's that scratch on your leg? Let me see. Which sister it was, she hesitated momentarily. Scratch? She queried cautiously. Yes. From when you bumped into the dishwasher door after dinner, I replied, leaning to inspect her feet. Oh, this. She responded a bit too nonchalantly. It's healed. There's no mark left. Indeed, I acknowledged, scrutinizing the area. I don't see any remnants. It looked awful then. Now it's gone. Straightening up, I noticed her exhale in relief. Chuckling to myself, I went to the bathroom to brush my teeth. The absence of a scratch and her reaction confirmed that whoever had been in our bedroom earlier was not the same person as the day before. Later, lying in bed, I awaited Molly's return from the bathroom. Hey, honey, I began. Let's pick up where we left off last night. It was incredible. She looked puzzled, even wary. What do you mean? She questioned. Remember, you came downstairs with that mischievous look and said, So, big boy, how do you want me tonight? It was electrifying. I responded with, Maybe giving my manhood some acknowledgement would be nice. You then teased me relentlessly until I was enthralled, mounting me like a wild force. God, it was mind-blowing. Don't you recall? Molly appeared momentarily shocked, then quickly mustered a pained expression as she contemplated. Of course, I remember, honey. I'm just not sure I'm up for such intensity tonight, all right? I conceded. Let's take it slow and gentle. But remind me of those things you shared last night, okay? Sliding into bed, she embraced me tightly, obscuring her face. Of course, baby, she mumbled. I'll say whatever you want. I just want to please you. Which parts did you particularly enjoy? Smirking to myself, I replied. You're not getting off that easy. While engaging in our intimate moments, she remained quiet as we caressed and touched each other. Despite my anger, I was instantly aroused. However, to my surprise, Molly seemed less engaged. My usual gestures failed to excite her. Pausing to observe her, I inquired, Is everything all right, honey? You seem a bit distant. Meeting my eyes, she responded, Sorry, Scott. I'm just a bit fatigued. And my stomach's upset, probably from the spicy food. Let's be intimate. But don't expect any wild antics tonight, okay? Smiling warmly, I reassured her, Of course, Molly. Let's take it slow and gentle, missionary style. We can save the passion for another evening. She kissed me gratefully. What ensued was a typical pleasant encounter between spouses, much like many previous nights with my wife, Molly, or so I believed. Sunday marked the day everything unraveled. The three couples had brunch downtown at Trentino, 
a favorite spot for all. Before heading to Ari and Hannah's, the men settled in to watch the Bengals game while the sisters enjoyed their own bonding time. Everyone seemed content all morning. I kept a close eye on Molly to ensure she didn't contact her sisters. I sensed her frustration, likely stemming from her Friday encounter, which I suspected she was not properly briefed about, judging by her reactions to the scratch and our intimate escapade. As we settled into Trentino and placed our drink orders, barely ten seconds passed before Molly locked eyes with one of her sisters, declaring Hannah, I need to freshen up. Care to join me? They exited, Molly looking perturbed and Hannah appearing puzzled. Upon their return, they seemed identical, pale and troubled. They struggled with their drinks and lost track of conversations, both avoiding my gaze, though I caught their intense looks when they thought I wasn't watching. As I suspected, Molly likely held Hannah responsible for withholding information about our previous night. Hannah, denying any knowledge, left them both visibly anxious. Initially, Amy remained unaffected, engaging cheerfully with her sisters and us. However, it didn't take long for her to pick up on the tense atmosphere. She couldn't pinpoint the issue, but the discomfort was palpable. As we wrapped up our brunch with plates of eggs, Benedict, salmon omelets, and Belgian waffles before us, Amy casually mentioned to Hannah, Honey, one of my contacts is really bothering me. Could you check on them? Upon their return a few minutes later, three visibly tense sisters sat at the table, avoiding eye contact and remaining silent. Their anxiety and distress lingered throughout the day, much to my satisfaction, while Ted, Ari, and I celebrated a Bengals victory, the sisters stayed hidden in the house's rear. We heard no communication from them for three hours. As we prepared to depart, both sisters-in-law couldn't meet my gaze. Dinner at our place transpired in quiet while I tried to maintain a cheerful demeanor by sharing amusing tales about work or our future vacation plans with Molly. Her responses were limited to brief smiles or one-word answers. It was evident she was fearful throughout the evening. As we tidied up and watched TV, I feigned normalcy while observing Molly's increasingly anxious and horrified expressions. Around 9.15 p.m., she hesitated. Honey, I'm going to see Hannah for a bit, okay? Sure, baby. While you're out, I might start packing my belongings and load them in the car. I'll likely need a truck for the furniture later in the week, I remarked casually. Her face turned pale. Scott, what? Why would you pack? I responded nonchalantly, because I'm leaving. I won't share a home with a deceitful woman, she gasped, her words trailing off. I don't. I don't understand. What? I retorted, locking eyes with her. See you when you get back, I said, heading upstairs. No, Scott, wait, she cried out, her voice quivering. Ignoring her pleas, I proceeded to pack my things. I anticipated that her initial move would be to contact her sisters, and my prediction proved correct. Barely three minutes later, Molly stood at the bedroom entrance announcing, Honey, Amy and Hannah have arrived. Can you join us downstairs? She appeared distressed, her cheeks marked with tears and her makeup smudged, a look of fear and sadness clouding her face eliciting a fleeting sense of sympathy from me. Sure, I responded, turning aside. I'll be down shortly. Swiftly, I scanned the room for a compact digital voice recorder, similar in size to a cigarette pack, which I occasionally used for recording notes while driving. After setting it to record, I pocketed it. Upon entering the kitchen, I found three women already seated at the table, their expressions tense and somber. Taking a seat, I surveyed each of them and broke the silence, asking, So, what happened? After a prolonged pause, Molly finally spoke. Scott, you know I care about you deeply, don't you? Pardon? I replied icily. Which sister are you? I'm Molly, your wife. Oh, really? Hold on a moment. I circled behind her to inspect her back. No distinguishing marks. I checked the other two sisters, finding the mark on one of them. They looked at me, puzzled. Resuming my seat, I remarked, All right, let's entertain the notion that you're Molly. 
Where did you sleep on Friday night when your sister was here? Pointing to the one with the mark, I added, Did you share my bed? Their gazes met mine, filled with confusion. Take your time, I urged. I'm not rushing. I'm confident there's a logical explanation as to why at least two, if not all three of you, have spent nights in my bed over the past three nights. A lengthy silence ensued. Tears streamed down Molly's face, while the other two sisters watched with somber expressions. Feigning an intention to stand, I remarked, I should pack my belongings. Wait, please, Molly interjected hurriedly. Let me explain. Just please, Scott. Give me an opportunity to clarify. While part of me yearned to berate her for being too late with her explanation, a deeper curiosity compelled me to listen. What convoluted reasoning could they offer for their actions? And more importantly, could I trust their version of events? I waited. But Molly's sobs rendered her unable to speak. One of her sisters stepped in, saying, Scott, it began as a foolish game. Initially, it was all in jest. But somehow, it escalated. About a month ago, we playfully teased each other about our spouses, discussing our preferences and dislikes, which led to conversations about intimacy. Eventually, we devised a plan to switch partners, challenging each other to act on it. She elaborated further. The switch took place last Friday evening. We exchanged clothes here in the kitchen and visited each other's homes. Amy was with you. I was with Ted. And Molly was with Ari. The following day, we switched back for a BBQ. It was a thoughtless act, Scott. We all recognize the gravity of our mistake now. You must be furious. But please consider giving Molly an opportunity to reconcile. She deeply cares for you, as evident by her evident distress, she gestured towards Molly, who was inconsolable crying. So, I claimed, Amy was with me, and Molly was with Ari. She confirmed, receiving nods from the others. Turning to Amy, I asked, So, Amy, how was it? How does intimacy with me compare to your usual encounters with Ted? Amy appeared taken aback, struggling to find words. It wasn't. I mean, Scott. It was actually quite enjoyable, she admitted hesitantly. Could you remind me of the specifics? What transpired between us? Amy avoided making eye contact. I. I honestly can't recall. It was just two nights ago. Are you telling me that after all these years of marriage you swap spouses with one of your sisters and you can't remember our activities? Do you have the onset of Alzheimer's or something? I pivoted to address Hannah. Nice attempt, Hannah, but your tale is utterly unbelievable. Yes, Amy was in my bed on Friday night. I marked her back with black ink while she slept, and the mark is still visible. However, we didn't engage in any intimate activities. I won't tolerate being deceived further by false claims that this was your inaugural endeavor. You believe I'm unaware that you three regard Eri as the most satisfying in bed? They gasped in response, but I pressed on. Do you think I'm oblivious to the fact that he spends seven nights a week with one of you while I'm left with intimacy less than twice a week? Yet I'm offered the consolation prize. The chance to satisfy your desires whenever you please. Pausing to gauge their reactions, I observed Molly sobbing uncontrollably while her sisters maintained solemn expressions. My patience was waning, but I sought a genuine confession. You have one more opportunity, I declared. Another chance to reveal the truth. This time, I want Molly to speak. How long have you been unfaithful with each of their spouses? With red-rimmed eyes, Molly looked at me pleadingly, and I waited in silence. After a tense pause, she averted her gaze to the table, confessing it began many years ago, since Hannah and Ari's wedding. Another silence ensued. Hannah interjected. It wasn't solely her doing, Scott. Amy and I were insistent, but it occurred sporadically, only occasionally at Molly's urging, perhaps a few times a year. All right, I responded. What happened next? Met with silence, I continued. So, it escalated over time? Reluctantly, Amy replied. Yes, it became more frequent. So, 
The three of you regularly rotated among three husbands like some twisted dance. Is that accurate, Molly? She nodded, looking utterly remorseful. When did Ari's involvement escalate to seven nights a week while I was left with mere casual encounters? She avoided meeting my eyes or responding. How often did Ari spend the night with you, Molly? She mumbled. One or two nights. Fantastic. I remarked sarcastically. I had reached my limit and saw no reason to prolong the conversation. It was merely physical, honey, she pleaded, locking eyes with me. It wasn't about love. It wasn't a reflection of our love for each other. Nor was it motivated by the desire for pregnancy, I suppose. She was visibly agitated. And her sisters wore expressions of concern. Scott, what are you implying? Do you think I'm unaware that you suspected I might become pregnant with Ted's child because you believed I doubted your capability? She gasped, rose from her seat, and approached me for a hug. I recoiled pushing her away, causing her to stumble into the refrigerator. You betrayed me in nearly every conceivable manner, aided by your two conniving sisters. Now, the three of you can continue sharing Ari and Ted, unless you're planning to introduce another man into your rotation. Without waiting for their response, I stormed through the swinging door and out of the kitchen. I grabbed my suitcase, exited through the front door, and didn't look back though I could hear sobbing from the kitchen. That night, fueled by anger and sleeplessness, I found myself in a Hyatt hotel room. The following morning, I took a day off from work, consulted an attorney, visited the bank, and arranged to meet Ari and Ted for lunch. I was so prompt that Ted had to cancel a prior engagement. We sat in a booth at a local diner, ordered sandwiches, and without preamble, I addressed the issue. Guys, you might find this hard to believe, but our wives have been unfaithful. Specifically, they've been rotating among the three of us for years. Ari appeared utterly stunned, while Ted surprisingly simply nodded and remarked, I had a feeling something like this might be going on. Both of us fixed our gaze on him, urging him to explain. Amy frequently forgot things, often failing to recall conversations from earlier in the day or the previous evening, he elaborated. I wasn't certain, of course, and I refrained from making any accusations until I had concrete evidence. So, I started jotting down the instances when she forgot. I decided that once I had substantial proof, I'd discuss it with you two, Ted explained. How did you discover the truth? He inquired, recounting the conversation I'd overheard and mentioning the ink mark trick. Ted listened intently. Ari echoed, incredible. Absolutely incredible. Upon concluding my recount, he hesitated. Are you positive about this, Scott? It seems unbelievable. I responded by playing a recording of my conversation with the trio from the previous night, offering no further commentary. After the tape concluded, we exchanged solemn glances and delved into a serious discussion. Both Ari and Ted notified their workplaces of their absence for the day. I informed them of my decision to divorce Molly. There was no turning back. While they remained uncertain about their next steps, our conversation lasted for hours, and ironically, I felt a newfound closeness to my two brothers-in-law. They were genuinely good men, and I would miss them. I secured an apartment, I fancied, returned with a moving truck to collect some of our furniture, and settled into my new place. By week's end, I had retrieved the rest of my belongings from the house. Molly persistently called both my work and personal cell phones. I instructed my assistant to reject her calls and opted for a new cell number. Keeping my apartment's phone number unlisted proved to be a wise decision. I initiated divorce proceedings and began outlining my future plans. On Thursday, Barbara, a colleague and friend engaged me in an unusual conversation. Though my distracted and irate demeanor was evident to everyone in the office, she broached the topic. I divulged the entire ordeal, and her face displayed a mix of shock, empathy, and oddly, a hint of delight. This irked me, and I voiced my displeasure. I'm genuinely sorry, Scott, she replied. I'm not condoning their actions. It's just... Well, I always harbored the thought that we could potentially make a great couple. I gazed at Barbara 
recognizing not only her kindness and humor, but also her tall, striking beauty, while I had always been vaguely aware of her attractiveness. My deep love for Molly had overshadowed any other considerations. Now, however, I found myself reevaluating my perception of her. Our conversations became more frequent, and though we maintained discretion, Barbara noticed the change in my demeanor towards her. Through my attorney, Molly expressed a strong desire to meet and explain her side of the story. Despite my belief that nothing she could say would alter the situation, I agreed to the meeting. Approximately six weeks after my relocation, we found ourselves alone in a conference room at my lawyer's office. Molly entered, her beauty undiminished, but her expression somber as she took her seat. I broke the silence. So Molly, I began, how are things? Are you expecting Ted's child? She blushed deeply. No, Scott. I haven't been intimate with Ted or anyone else. I have no intention of becoming pregnant by anyone other than you. Recalling the night I overheard their conversation, I interjected. You know, that night I was on the verge of telling you that Dr. Randell confirmed my sperm were viable. Though slightly low in count, they were potent enough for conception. We wouldn't have needed Ted's assistance. However, considering your ongoing relations with him and Ari, I suppose it's a moot point. Tears welled in her eyes. Please, Scott, let me explain. Can I express how remorseful I am? How awful I feel? Do you believe your pain surpasses mine? She gazed at me with sorrow-filled eyes, shaking her head. Fine. I responded with a sigh. Go ahead. But spare me the declarations of love. Don't claim this had nothing to do with us. Just don't. She hesitated before saying, Scott, this wasn't about us. It was, I guess, a reckless game Hannah, Amy, and I played. We've engaged in such antics since our school days. It was never meant to damage anyone. I probed further. Have you involved all your previous partners in this? She admitted, almost every long-term boyfriend we've had. My sisters and I have always been inseparable. This bond, I suppose, made us even closer. We shared everything, clothes, secrets, friends, and even boyfriends. I remained silent, allowing her to speak her peace. When we got married, I believed this behavior would cease. And it did for a while, she began. Hold on, I interrupted. Did your sisters have relations with me while we were dating? She blushed, replying, yes, a couple of times. I wasn't keen on it, especially as our relationship grew more serious. But they insisted, citing our shared history. I retorted sarcastically. Well, I must have passed some tests since you didn't leave me. She remained silent. Molly, you don't grasp the gravity of this, do you? You manipulated me so you and your sisters could have a good time. You've been with Ari instead of me because he satisfied you better. Have you even considered my feelings? What's so special about him? Never mind. Don't answer. I don't want to hear it. Her lips quivered as she replied. Scott, I realize how wrong it was. But remember, you've been with all three of us. I shot back, but I was unaware. Haven't you figured it out yet? Even if we had discussed swapping partners, which I would never consent to, and even if we had decided to do it, I would derive excitement from being with other women. But I thought it was always you, Molly. For me, it was never about someone new and thrilling. It was about the woman I cherished more than anything. My patience wore thin. How could she fail to comprehend the magnitude of her actions? Listen, I asserted. It's straightforward. I was your husband. You should have prioritized me above everyone else. Our bond should have superseded any other relationship. But that didn't happen. You placed Hannah and Amy above me. You prioritized intimacy with Ari over me. You planned to conceive a child with Ted without ever informing me. Now, you can have them, but you won't have me. I've had enough. I rose from my seat, fighting back tears. She pleaded. But baby, I don't want them. I don't need my sisters. I need you, I responded. Isn't that touching? After all these years, you decide to choose me over your sisters. But the tables have turned. Now it's my choice. 
and I choose to part ways with the woman who deceived and betrayed me for years. Farewell. She covered her face with her hands, sobbing uncontrollably, but made no effort to stop me as I made my way towards the door. After that discussion, life suddenly appeared more manageable. I began dating Barbara, and by our third date, I realized there were other women out there besides Molly or her sisters with whom I could share intimate moments. Barbara was vivacious and appreciative, and our first night together extended into an entire weekend. It was exhilarating and enjoyable, although I wasn't sure where it would lead. Regardless, it significantly improved my mood. While Barbara and I continued to see each other and share intimate moments frequently, we're taking things slow. Barbara understands my current state of confusion and doesn't pressure me, which I deeply value. Eri chose not to expel Hannah from their lives, which wasn't entirely surprising. After all, he was her preferred partner, and the revelations about their activities didn't hit him as hard as they did Ted and me. However, he insisted that Hannah grow her hair long to prevent any more switching without his knowledge. He warned her that any further deceit involving me, Ted, or anyone else would leave her penniless. While Eri mentioned he wouldn't mind occasional encounters with Amy or Molly, it would be on his terms, not theirs. Eri shared with me that Hannah seemed visibly upset, but chose to remain silent. He added with a smirk that she realizes she's on shaky ground. Ted unintentionally dealt Amy a significant blow. After landing an excellent job in Chicago, he informed Amy of his plans to move in three weeks. You can join me, and we can seek counseling to mend our marriage, he proposed. Or you can stay in Cincinnati with your sisters. Decide now. Amy is torn. She's unable to sever ties with Ted, but also can't imagine life without her sisters. It's a tough situation. In my opinion, to hell with her. To hell with all three of them.